from the grassroots all the way to this capital of Nairobi. On the 13th September 2022, last year, when I took office, I undertook to ensure the urgent transformation of our economy and to stop and reverse the negative trends of runaway unemployment, yawning inequality, and widespread poverty, which have denied Kenyans their dignity and extinguished their dreams. The mass appeal of the bottom-up economic transformation agenda was due in large part to the fact that its development and articulation, as well as its content and implementation strategy, represented our national values in action. It was inclusive, democratic, committed to social justice, and the protection of the marginalized. Our commitment to bring the national values and principles of governance to life in order to significantly enhance the well-being of every individual and promote the unity, stability, security, and development of our country began long before the last election and will endure well beyond our time. It has been my manifest intention to live up to all the commitments set out in the plan, and despite enormous challenges and tremendous difficulties, we have made encouraging progress in a positive direction. This has not only vindicated our philosophy of inclusive transformation in pursuit of shared prosperity, but it has also increased our confidence that we are on the right path and shall, in due course, deliver the transformation of our nation in full. It is important for us to point out that we began the implementation of our mandate to transform Kenya's economy from the bottom up under extreme difficult circumstances. Not to excuse failure or to justify inability or omission to, the ne to do the necessary work. Not at all. Rather, we do it to emphasize the significance of our progress, underscore the possibility of transformation under daunting conditions, and express well-founded confidence that when sufficient progress is made, we shall do much more and go much further in delivering the Kenya we want for our generations and also for posterity. In our plan, we identified three primary challenges, external shocks, fiscal distress, and structural imbalance that heavily strained our economy, causing nationwide difficulty. The COVID-19 pandemic, coupled with global supply chain disruptions and geopolitical conflicts, significantly raised inflation and interest rates, adversely affecting our economy, while low agricultural investment and a prolonged drought led to food shortages and made Kenya a net importer of food in a volatile international market. It was under conditions of such ex extreme difficulty that the people of Kenya entrusted us with the responsibility of simultaneously generating effective solutions to immediate problems, providing a credible pathway to stability in the medium term, and undertaking long-term structural transformation of our economy, but in a manner which paid attention to the needs and aspirations of Kenyans, especially those at the bottom of the pyramid. The transformation of our economy is not only desirable and important, it is also necessary and urgent. And the people of Kenya have made this clear at every opportunity. Our duty as leaders is to listen keenly and comply with the people's wishes. Kenyans want to proceed in a new direction and demand a new conversation that puts ordinary Kenyans, the Mamamboga security, well-being, interests, and aspirations at the front and center of all policy and governance discourse. Citizen freedoms and fundamental rights lie at the heart of enterprise and democracy. 
Accordingly, our governance system must be fit for purpose, able to protect people and their belongings, safeguard freedom, facilitate democracy, and promote market efficiency. To do this, law enforcement must be robust. Judicial integrity, efficiency and independence, absolute and the right to the protection of law, non-negotiable and impartial. Our police service and other actors in the justice law and order chain, including the judiciary, must therefore be professional, independent, impartial, effective, and inspired by national values and principles of governance. In keeping with our promise to the people of Kenya, I signed important instruments on my first day on duty. Among them, the delayed appointments of six judges to the Court of Appeal as recommended by the Judicial Service Commission. Enhanced allocation through this house to the judiciary by three billion Kenya shillings. Designated the Inspector General who is sitting in this house as the accounting officer of the National Police Service to enhance police independence and subsequently appointed a task force led by the former Chief Justice David Maraga to review the terms and conditions of service of members of the National Police Service. This was necessary, members so that we can cement our place as a nation on the firm foundation of the rule of law. Together with the people of Kenya, we have changed everything. We have transformed the national political conversation from personalities to issues, from regional or ethnic largesse to opportunities for all our young people, from divisions to inclusion, and from status quo to the bottom-up economic transformation for shared prosperity. To date, Kenyans remain fully seized of the agenda, engaging vigorously and with unrelenting focus on expanding agricultural productivity to deal with the cost of living, affordable housing to create enterprise, jobs, and dignified uh, dwellings, universal health coverage, for a healthy, productive nation, and digital transformation to create e-commerce, create jobs, and make government efficient, effective, and accessible, especially government services. Also, fintechs, including the Hustler Fund, have benefited from the space around technology, and the digital transformation. By virtue of the internal coherence of our constitutional dispensation, national values and principles of governance set out core directive precepts whose observance imbues every decision and action with implicit constitutionality to the extent that our plan is aligned with Article 43 the implementation of the bottom-up economic transformation agenda is a program to intensify the actualization of national values with a special focus on citizens at the bottom of the pyramid. From the first day in office, we have worked hard every day to move our agenda forward amid many challenges to forge a path in the direction of progress. This is the essence of our commitment to make progress despite challenges and move forward by overcoming great obstacles. We must never be defined by our problems and Kenya's destiny cannot be derailed by our challenges. Honorable members, the cost of living is not an abstract phenomenon. It is a reality experienced by households which can be addressed through practical action and effective measures. One of the most salient interventions in addressing the high cost of living 
is the strategy to support agricultural production through this, uh, throughout the sector, ranging from food and cash crops as well as livestock value chains. I am committed to put the shame of hunger behind us once and for all. We rolled out a countrywide farmer registration and fertilizer subsidy program that has made available 5.5 million bags to farmers across Kenya. We have progressively reduced the cost of fertilizer from 6,500 to 2,500, increased maize acreage under production by an extra 200,000 acres this year, and enhanced maize production by an additional 18 million bags this year. As a result of these interventions, today, a two kilogram packet of maize flour is selling at a low of 145 and a high of 175, depending on the brand you buy, down from 250 shillings a few months ago. The famous Gorogoro of maize is selling at between 60 and 75. Honorable members, you know how much it costed a few months ago. We have also established 22 new fish landing sites in nine counties in Nyanza and the coast region. We have funded and organized beach management units into cooperatives, set up two hatcheries in Kabonyo in Kisumu County and in Shimoni in Kwale County. And we are in the process of completing Liwatoni fishing, uh, fish processing plant in Mombasa by end of next month, and Shimoni fish port by the end of next year. Again, to bring our blue economy resources into the realm of food production. To achieve efficiency, transparency, and accuracy in fertilizer distribution, we enrolled farmers on a digital register with accurate details of the location and acreage of their agricultural land holdings. This database enabled us to implement an e-voucher system through which farmers receive their fertilizer consignments for planting and top dressing of maize, tea, coffee, rice, potatoes, cotton, edible oils, sugarcane across the country. Our farmers are the best people to speak about the success of the fertilizer program. Yesterday, I spoke to several farmers in different parts of the country. Ms. Alice Nato, a single mother in a place called Milo in Bungoma, told me that the 2,500 fertilizer had doubled the yield in her farm from 52 bags of maize last year to 120 bags of maize this year. Another farmer, Mr. Albert Muni, Muni from Embu, appreciated the impact of fertilizer subsidy had in, in his farm and asked me to work out a way that the fertilizer can be delivered closer to the farmers rather than at the National Cereals and Produce Board depot. I assured him that I will work with the governor of Embu and with all governors to actualize his proposal for him and for other farmers who believe the same. But it was Mr. Samuel Chacha of Korea who graphically painted the picture of transformation the fertilizer subsidy has done in his farm with a phrase that struck my mind. He simply told me, Mr. President, Shambayangu in a meta meta. <laughs> Further, we have made adequate arrangements, including investment in necessary infrastructure to facilitate post harvest management and to prevent post harvest losses. 17 certified warehouses, jointly managed by the National Cereals and Produce Board and the private sector owners with a combined capacity of 365 metric tons or 4,090 kilogram bags 
have been prepared in the maize growing areas. The National Cereals and Produce Board shall provide a subsidy maize drying service to farmers at a fixed cost, as was announced by the Minister of Kenya Shillings 70 per bag, which is a significant improvement from the previous rate of Kenya Shillings 350 per bag. Yesterday again, the first consignment of the 100 mobile dryers this house facilitated my administration to buy for use by our farmers I announced to you yesterday the first consignment of the dryers docked in the country additionally we are enhancing dairy productivity for better farmer returns the government working with milk processors and I had a long conversation with them in Akuru we are mapping the country to ensure coolers are supplied where they are needed. Soon, farmers will be paid based on milk quality, boosting incomes, and they can also enjoy global market access. Our reforms in the coffee sector are bearing fruit, with our farmers set to earn four times advanced pay for their crop from a low of 20 to now Kenya shillings 80. Following the allocation of Kenya shillings 4 billion from the coffee cherry fund that was ably facilitated by this house. Coffee reforms regulations will give farmers the necessary representation and weight at the national coffee auction. It is my intention to make sure that the auction operates with farmers at the center of it. These measures are expected to aid ongoing efforts, including expanding production to new counties and double coffee output in the next four years. The government of Kenya is currently restructuring public sugar mills, expediting the leasing of five companies for rehabilitation and expansion to boost industry competitiveness before the commercial sugar safeguards expire. The objective includes creating a competitive sector, raising farmer incomes, and enhancing productivity. This House agreed with my cabinet that we waive Kenya shillings 117 billion non-performing debt for government-owned sugar factories, for which I am grateful to this House. This House also approved 1.7 billion shillings that will go into paying farmer arrears and other complications that arose out of the challenges our sugar sector was facing. I want to promise this house that in the next couple of weeks we shall be dispersing that money so that farmers in the sugar growing area can go home for Christmas with their money. As earlier indicated, our public borrowing had long crowded out the productive sector from the financial markets, raising the cost of credit and slowing down trade and commerce. As I told Kenyans on my first day in office, times were difficult and many people are struggling and necessary and effective sustainable solutions were urgently needed. We must admit, honorable members, that as a country, we had been living large and way beyond our means. The time has come, therefore, to retire the false comforts and illusionary benefits of wasteful expenditure and counterproductive subsidies on consumption by which we dug ourselves deeper into the hole of avoidable debt. Action may not be easy, but it is ethical, responsible, prudent, and most importantly, necessary. We've had to take hard decisions and make painful choices because we owe it to the people of Kenya to do the right thing and to confront facts as they are without flinching or equivocating. We have worked hard at home and abroad to mobilize a broad coalition of bilateral development partners 
Many of them, I see them in this house, multilateral development banks and other agencies which have rallied to pull our country back from the brink of debt distress and set us today firmly on the path towards sustainable economic growth. Our efforts to stabilize the situation have yielded such progress that next month, in December, we will be able to settle the first Kenya shillings $300 million or $500 billion Kenya shillings installment of the US dollars 2 billion euro bond debt that falls due next year. I can now confirm with confidence that we will and we shall pay the debt that has become a source of much concern to citizens, markets, and our partners. Having said this, I further announce to the nation that our intention, consistent with sustained effort here and abroad, have enabled us to normalize our relations with the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the Africa Development Bank, and various development partners to such an extent that they are now working with us to implement the bottom-up economic transformation plan. As I earlier indicated, our public borrowing had long crowded our productive sector from the, from the financial markets, raising the cost of credit and slowing down trade and commerce, especially the micro, small, and medium enterprises, including Mamamboga. Consequently, many enterprises and entrepreneurs were referred for blacklisting by the credit reference bureaus, where 7 million borrowers were listed by last year. We committed to provide affordable and accessible credit and restore small business owners to good standing with credit rating agencies. A deliberate, targeted strategic financial inclusion fund, the Hustler Fund, providing affordable credit and mobilizing savings for individuals and small businesses was launched on the 30th of November, 2022. The public response to the Hustler Fund has exceeded most initial projections and surprised even the most hardened skeptics. By, en by the end of last month, the fund had disbursed Kenya shillings 36.6 billion and in savings, 2.3 billion, and with 7.5 million repeat borrowers, whose overall repayment rate is at 73%. The DOP borrower of the fund has so far accessed Kenya shillings 4.5 million in 816 transactions, while the top voluntary saver is at 631,491. In the intervening period, the Hustler Fund has also launched a group product which has attracted 50,000 active groups to the platform, and which, of which 20,000 have received 151 million Kenya shillings. The Asla Fund has provided us not only the huge pent-up demand for affordable credit, but also the readiness of Kenyans to express or to embrace credit and savings and to pay their loans on time with minimum prompting. The notion that Kenyans are not credit worthy or are high-risk borrowers is nothing more than an unjust financial profiling which has, in many instances, become a needless, self-fulfilling prophecy. Yesterday, when I called Harrison Karisa Kenga, a tuk-tuk operator in Mombasa, who has accessed 714,000 from the Hustler Fund, he suggested to me to find a way to have the fund provide asset financing 
so that he can buy for himself a tuk-tuk because the one he had was not his. I assured him that during my address today, I would ask the ministry responsible to respond to him. Consequently, I hereby direct the Ministry of Cooperatives and MSMEs to expeditiously engage Mr. Kenga. I will give you his telephone number. The impact, the impact of the Hustler Fund is summarized by a story over Mr. Sospita Ondiek from Kisi. I suggest that the Kenyan film industry should look for him so that he can tell you his full story. Mr. Ondiek has a plumbing and tiling business in Kisi. And through the Hustler Fund, he has accessed 1.7 million in the many transactions he has undertaken to enhance our savings that have consistently been among the lowest globally and to correct the delayed transformation of our social security architecture. Fundamental reforms are underway in our savings and social security space. As promised, we committed to take deliberate measures to foster a strong culture of savings amongst Kenyans and enable them mobilize resources for investment and development of intergenerational capital to eliminate old age poverty and to ensure comfort in retirement. Until recently, the rate of Kenya's public pension saving stood at 1.4 billion shillings a month, which is the lowest in our region at only 12.5% of our GDP. As a result of our initial interventions, the savings situation in Kenya is changing for the better. Contributions, honorable members, to the National Security Fund have grown from 1.4 billion shillings in January to 6.5 billion shillings every month this month. The implication of this growth in our national savings is that it will significantly consolidate our nation's ability to invest in development using domestic resources as opposed to us going to borrow other people's money when they save. Honorable members, majority of Kenyans live in their own rural homes, even though many experience land and settlement challenges, including landlessness, insecure land tenure, and perennial squatter problems. Acute housing challenges are principally an urban phenomenon, and they present a serious threat to health and safety, as well as dignity of people, particularly low-income earners. The proliferation of slums in our urban areas indicate the extent of this serious problem and the urgency with which it must be addressed to enable Kenyans have greater choice in leading dignified, safe, and healthy lives affordably. Low supply of affordable housing units in Kenya is acute, making rent a huge component of the cost of living for many households. The increase in affordable housing units is a strategic intervention to not only supply affordable dwellings for Kenyans, but also as a means to reduce the cost of living. Three categories of houses will be supplied by this program. Social housing, affordable housing, and for the, the rest, market rate housing. Interest on financing is where we intend to make the big difference. Interest at the moment, as all of us know in this house, is at almost 18%. But under this program, all interest should be or will be at single digit. For social housing, the interest will be at 3%. You know, honorable members, that we all get 
So even the people in the social space, they also deserve to get 3%. Those in the affordable housing space will get 6%, and 9% for the people in the market category. The affordable housing program has received tremendous support from county governments across Kenya. And I want to thank governors, and I know the chair of the Council of Governors is here, through her, all governors who have worked with us to make sure that this program becomes a reality. The construction of 46,792 units in various parts of Kenya is already underway, while another 40,000 are ready to commence in a couple of weeks. 50,000 Kenyans are working. People who are previously unemployed, they are now engaged directly and indirectly in this enterprise. And the numbers will significantly increase as the projects move into the next phase and as we roll out many more units. A total of 746,795 housing units are in the pipeline as I talk to you, under various stages of delivery. More jobs are being created with the formalization of the Juakali clusters, providing products like doors, hinges, and windows. And this morning, as I visited one of the sites that I went to launch the construction in March, I was amazed that a, a, a site that was flat in March, today, and I was with the Member of Parliament for Ruiru, today has eight 11 block units almost at 60% complete. And I also met the Juakali cluster for Ruiru, and they have been given a contract of 140 million to be able to supply doors and windows. Architects, engineers, quantity surveyors, masons, electricians, plumbers, transporters, steel and cement factory workers, and hardware merchants will be partakers in this transformative plan. I spoke to Moses today at the site in Ruido an electrician, and he told me out of the 1,700 workers in the site today, he was in charge of 114 electricians who were engaged in that site. And he asked me, Mr. President, make sure the next site is ready for us because we will finish this ahead of time. Let me also say we are constructing 400 markets across Kenya to provide Mamamboga with a dignified working environment, complete with water, electricity, and other amenities. And I want to thank members of this house for participating in various ways and working with us and also with the counties in identifying the right locations for these markets. Ladies and gentlemen, Honorable members, our education system must develop a formidable reservoir of skill, talent, highly competitive and innovative human capital to support our vision of an economically transformed Kenya. Within weeks of taking office, I appointed the Presidential Working Party on Education Reform, led by Professor Rafael Munavu, my former teacher who provided clarity on transition to the new competence-based curriculum and made further recommendations on necessary reforms in our education system from early childhood all the way to the tertiary levels. The working party concluded its work and submitted a report whose recommendations are already being implemented. The urgent and vexing question of transition to junior school has been settled and the Kenya primary school education assessment will be used for the exclusive purpose 
of monitoring learners' progress and not for placement in any grade. In keeping with our commitment, 56,750 new teachers have been employed. I'm sure the Honorable Milemba can confirm this. While 8,200 primary school teachers were retrained to equip them with capacity to effectively deliver learning and teaching at junior school levels. With changes to the entry requirements for teacher training colleges, admission has increased by 300% to now 20,456 trainees. I was privileged to be in Kwale last week to open the Kwale uh, uh, Teacher Training College, which had only um, uh, 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 less than 100 students a few, a few months ago. And when I went there, the, head, the principal told me that the numbers have increased four times. At the tertiary level, the working party recommended an overhaul of the existing education funding framework to a variable scholarship and loan model in order to address the financing gap which denied many Kenyans the opportunity to pursue the tertiary education in our universities and TVETs, but also created many complications in our universities and institutions of higher learning that by last year, our universities had accumulated debts of close to 60 billion Kenya shillings. I sat down with all the vice chancellors of our 41 public universities and we came up with a proposal that we are now implementing. The new model for financial support is student-centered and deploys a rigorous, impartial means-testing instrument to establish the level of need of every student, which then becomes the primary consideration in allocating scholarships and loans. To fully democratize our education system and make higher education accessible and affordable to all, we have also chartered the Open University of Kenya following requisite cabinet and parliamentary approvals. I want to thank this House for expediting the Open University Charter that had been in the works for the last 10 years. I also want to announce to you that the first 1,000 students will report next month. In the course of consulting Kenyans from all walks of life during the formulation of the bottom-up economic transformation agenda, the foundational contribution of health to citizen well-being and the role of costs in driving up poverty were identified as chronic. The implications are very clear and we cannot afford to delay the delivery of universal health care anymore. Consequently, we have instituted radical reforms in the provision of health care services in Kenya, including the enactment of four new laws that will anchor the implementation of this bottom-up approach to health care. I am tremendously grateful to this House and honorable members for enacting the Primary Health Care Act, the new Social Health Insurance Act, the Digital Health Act, and the Facility Improvement Financing Act. These laws, honorable members, will usher in and guarantee a new era in the provision of health care covering all essential services from preventive, promotive, curative, palliative, and rehabilitative services, guaranteeing every Kenyan access to comprehensive and quality health care. Under Afia Nyumbani, we have scaled up our investment in health care workforce, employing 20,000 new health care workers deploying 8,429 workers whose contracts had lapsed and enrolling 3,394 interns across the country to increase the availability of human capital 
in our public health sector. Working with county governments, and I'm again grateful to them, we have taken measures to resolve the perennial challenge of human resource management in the health sector, occasioning strikes by establishing the Kenya Health Human Resource Advisory Council, which will be a trusted mediator between government at both levels and our health uh, sector workers. Further, under the Afya Nyumbani model, we identified preventive care as an essential pillar of healthcare service delivery because it enables Kenyans to manage their conditions early enough before they cause serious harm in their well-being and productivity. Community health promotion is our bottom-up intervention to deliver preventive and promotive health solutions at the grassroots by deploying community health promoters to visit Kenyans at their homes, provide basic diagnosis for common conditions, and refer cases to appropriate medical facilities. Together with all the 47 counties, and again, I am grateful to the governors, we have deployed 100,000 community health promoters fully equipped with the necessary kits and an electronic community health information system. In the last one month, CHPs have attended to 1.2 million households, just in the last one month. I spoke on phone to Mr. Masood Dirie, a community health promoter in Garissa, yesterday, who told me he has been a community health promoter, a health volunteer since 2011. Unlike before, now he has a full medical kit and has used it to confirm that seven people in his locality had high blood pressure. In a twist of faith, he tested himself and discovered that he too had high blood pressure. <laughs> That's what he told me. And so, apart from referring others, he also had to make way to the hospital. Mr. Obembi Ogutu of Homa Bay told me that the program now makes primary health care a paperless engagement, saying it had started to reduce queues in hospitals. Through the Facility Improvement Financing Act 2023, we have established a framework that confers financial autonomy to health facilities, enabling them to retain funds generated with a mandate to improve facilities, capacity, and to provide healthcare services within that locality. In addition, the Kenya Medical Supplies Agency, as part of many radical reforms, will now deploy ICT to manage supply chains of essential health products and commodities. As a result of this small intervention, KEMSA has improved its, stock, its, its stocking rate from 40% to 60% in the last five months. And we are now targeting 80% by March next year. As it's becoming clear, we cannot hope anymore to deliver services to Kenyans in their millions across the country with any measure of efficiency, integrity, transparency, and accountability without ICT. From education and health to agriculture and financial inclusion, Digital technologies reign supreme in transforming service delivery, governance improvements, and catalyzing efficiency throughout the economy. We have commenced the rollout of 100,000 kilometers of the last mile fiber optic connectivity to make reliable high-speed internet available throughout Kenya, along with 25,000 free Wi-Fi hotspots in all market centers. The rollout, and I was given a statistic by the end of this, uh, by the end of this year, the first 2,200 would be rolled out, and another 1,450 ICT hubs in every ward. 
I want to thank the membership of this house for considering to change the NGCDF Act so that you can also deploy those resources in the ICT space and enable millions of young people in your constituencies and wards to access internet and technology for digital jobs, e-commerce, and to give them the possibility of working on remote jobs. I have engaged the chair and committee of this house in that space. We have agreed on the model of how the ICT hub will look like, and I am truly grateful that Parliament came through and considered changing the law so that we can work on this together. We have expanded digital provision of public services to encompass 13,000 services to date. And it is my commitment to ensure full digitization by the end of next month. Our decision to enhance efficiency and integrity in the provision of government services has gone a long way to improve revenue collection. Working with the private sector, we launched the local assembly of affordable smartphones last week in Athi River. Digitization and automation enhance service delivery and citizen satisfaction and also assures greater accuracy, transparency and accountability and reduces opportunity for corruption in the course of transacting with government ministries, departments and agencies. Corruption, honorable members, wastage, inefficiency, and negligence are serious threats to our transformation agenda and unacceptable, unacceptable practice that has no place in our nation. I have given my firm assurance to the people of Kenya that cases of misconduct and corruption shall be dealt with ruthlessly, with, finalis with finality, and expeditiously. I ask this Honorable House to finalize the Assets Declaration and Conflict of Interest Bill to further tighten our anti-corruption policy framework and eliminate space for those who want to steal our money. The security and safety of all citizens is our foremost commitment and most fundamental obligation without which every other endeavor is not possible. The reason why Kenya has continued on the path of steady progress is that we have maintained stability, peace and security by affirming our territorial integrity and maintaining internal tranquility. This is not to say our country has not had its share of security challenges. The specter of terrorism is a continuing threat that we must remain constantly vigilant against. Pockets of banditry, cattle rustling, and armed lawlessness have besieged and devastated communities in the North Rift, Northeastern, and occasionally parts of Eastern and the Coast regions. We all know that insecurity disrupts lives and destroys livelihoods. Our country has lost too many people to this menace. Many children have been orphaned and missed school, and many families have been displaced because of lawless men taking up illegal arms and waging war against communities. The government exists to ensure that those who challenge our sovereignty, territorial integrity, national security, and the safety of the people of Kenya are expeditiously countered and rendered harmless. We have therefore taken firm and decisive measures to deal with the challenge of banditry, armed crime, cattle rustling, and other forms of impunity in all parts of the country, beginning with a successful security operation to restore calm in the North Rift. We have been systematic, focused, thorough, and relenting, and totally committed to removing for good all threats to lives and livelihoods of Kenyans. I know there are pushbacks from the criminals, but I want to assure the honorable members of this house that we will be unrelenting. And until it is done, it is not done. 
in discharging this commitment, we have been mindful not to use security imperatives to commit impunity, including misuse of resources and extrajudicial infringement on freedoms and fundamental human rights of citizens. <coughs> Sorry. We are conscious to provide security as a public service for the benefit of law-abiding citizens and as a guarantor of economic growth. Therefore, our security services have been committed to a citizen-centric, rights-focused, inclusive, and community-based security strategy. I am therefore quite clear that there exists no tension between the effective delivery of security services and the upholding of human rights and fundamental freedoms. We can be and therefore must be secure, yet free and democratic. In order to entrench our all of society coalition, we have resolved to enhance diversity and inclusion by expanding enrollment in the National Youth Service as an agency to capture young people at the bottom of the pyramid. Consequently, we are doubling enrollment to 40,000 yearly in the National Youth Service and have made it absolutely mandatory that every village, center, town, and city in Kenya is properly represented in the recruitment. To consolidate this proposition, we have directed that 80% of future recruitment to all security services, from the military, the police, KWS, Kenya Forest Service, and all other security agencies 80% will come from the well-trained, talented, and committed young men and women who have undergone training at the NYS. <laughs> Kenya finds itself continuously summoned to its duty of care to serve as a reliable anchor to our region's security, peace, and stability. We continue to answer our historic, moral, and strategic responsibilities to deploy our resources in solidarity with our region in general and our immediate neighborhood in particular. To prevent the imminent collapse of Goma in Eastern DRC, which we have had serious, cons would have had serious consequences for the wider East African region, we deployed our troops under the East African Community Regional Force. We have continued to anchor the fight against Al-Shabaab in Somalia under the Africa Union tran uh, Transition Mission in Somalia. The Kenya Defense Forces continues to make Kenya proud, and I salute them. It is our firm position that only a democratically accountable system that is sensitive and responsive to the adverse and diverse composition of Sudan can secure that country. Given the regional interconnectedness together with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the US, we have engaged the JEDA process as IGAD to fashion a framework that will be best placed to successfully deliver peace in Sudan. Honorable members, our economy is firmly interconnected with regional continental, and global economic systems. Our security and stability is likewise integrated with those of our neighbors. Kenya has a found fundamental, essential, legitimate, and clear interest in conducting robust diplomacy in form of bilateral and multilateral engagements. For the last 12 months, we have continued to fulfill our international obligations through Kenya's leadership in the international arena. This is underscored by the high-level 
summits Kenya has hosted and participated in. Kenya successfully hosted the inaugural first ever Africa Climate Summit. We also hosted the 43rd ordinary session of the Executive Council, the fifth media coordination meeting of the Africa Union, and the regional economic communities, and the first ever African edition of the Berlin Climate and Security Conference in Nairobi. All these summits have brought into our country about 30 heads of state and government and over 30,000 delegates from different parts of the world. The government has made deliberate efforts to harness the immense and potential of Kenyans also in the diaspora. Indeed, I established the State Department of Diaspora in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs so that they can fully participate in the affairs of our motherland. I have committed to work collaboratively, consultatively, and, cons uh, and collectively with the counties and all Kenyans to uphold our cherished national values as human dignity, equity, social justice, national unity, inclusiveness, integrity, good governance, transparency, and accountability. I encourage all honorable members and indeed all Kenyans to embrace an open mindset in regard to national strategic interests and to leverage on our rich heritage and diversity. One of the greatest strengths of our country is our capacity to devise bold, unprecedented solutions to our threats and challenges, create imaginative strategies to avert danger, and chart new paths to deliver us from adversity. There is no doubt that our nation has been confronted with immense pressure emanating from political misunderstandings sometimes and electoral disagreements. And it is because we have a robust democracy, which we are very proud of. Such pressure can disrupt lives and livelihoods and undermine our economy. Thankfully, Kenyans always find the moral strength and political imagination to reach across the political divide and engage in dialogue in the spirit of goodwill, fraternity, and commitment to the national interest and the welfare of the nation. It would be, honorable members, remiss of me not to mention the ongoing bipartisan process of national dialogue that has enabled our leaders to find common ground on many of the issues whose resolution will accelerate our transformation, deepen our democracy, and enhance national unity. Specifically, I thank the two co-chairs, my good brother, Stephen Kalonzo Musioka, our former president, and the leader of majority in the House, Kimani Ishungwa, for doing a wonderful job. Congratulations, gentlemen. I salute the courage and patriotism of my fellow leaders who have embraced national dialogue and engage and encourage all of us to keep up the noble work of bringing Kenyans together. There is no such, there is so much to report about the progress we have made in serving the people of Kenya and transforming our economy. I have provided only a summarized highlight of the most salient instances of transformational progress in my address. It is my present duty to hand to the speakers of the Houses of Parliament the three reports in full as follows. The 10th Annual Report on Measures Taken and Progress Made in the Realization of the National Values and Principles of Governance. The 10th Annual Report on Progress Made in Fulfilling the international obligations of the Republic of Kenya. Number three, the 10th annual report on the state of national security. I will not hesitate to acknowledge with profound humility that a lot of the successes we have achieved in delivering the bottom-up economic transformation agenda was due to the patriotic support and solidarity from members 
of this House, both in the Senate and the National Assembly. We are fortunate to be attempting this ambitious historic project of radical change in a bipartisan era when dialogue, consensus, collaboration, and partnership have replaced dissent, contention, conflict, and disarray as the operating principles of political discourse. Issue-oriented politics, honorable members, is not just a democratic necessity and a pathway to sustainable transformation. It is the most effective way of mobilizing diversity for collective national good. As the world reels from the destructive assaults on democracy and the relentless of subversion of human dignity, freedom reigns supreme in our land and our democracy grows deeper and more robust by the day. Our collective resolve as a nation to further entrench constitutionalism, democracy, good governance is a unique quality confers as a unique in a, in a unique quality confers on us an incomparable advantage the power to face the future without fear to imagine a transformation that extends to posterity and envisions prosperity that benefits our children's offsprings and beyond as long as we put the welfare of the people of Kenya as our central agenda and play our respective roles in ensuring that government is effective and accountable, efficient and transparent, Kenya's best fortunes are well within our reach. I am persuaded, honorable members, beyond any reasonable doubt, that we shall achieve transformation beyond our wildest dreams within this generation. As a leadership and as a people, we have a historic opportunity to preside over the greatest transformation and progress ever witnessed in our nation. Kenya is a nation of brave, hardworking, enterprising people who are determined to prevail in the struggle for economic freedom and win the race for prosperity. In a nation like ours, great deeds will be accomplished whenever and wherever opportunity exists. This is why the hard work we have done is already showing the promise of abundant fruit. We have laid a firm foundation for rapid development, and Kenya is no longer on the marks. The state of our nation at this moment in time is prepared, all set, and ready to go. I thank you, God bless you, and God bless Kenya. Thank you very much.